Hello and welcome back to another episode of Heart of the Cast. We have another evergreen little story for you today. We've got uh, an interesting topic. We're uh, we're discussing another controversial subject of sorts. What are we talking about today? We're talking about hand traps, which I feel like some of them are controversial, not all of them, but I think it's still regardless uh, interesting to revisit that sort of discussion. Um, like we've had it about floodgates and I think this one is a little less controversial, but there's still some controversy to be had, yeah. There's always going to be a strong opinion when it comes to uh, game-defining pieces like uh, trap cards, hand traps, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So today, we're going to take you through... Um, uh, this is this is the itinerary. So today, we're going to be discussing the history and evolution of the hand traps. We're going to be starting from the very beginning, the very first hand traps, which essentially were just battle traps, things like Karibo. We're going to be talking about a big milestone in hand trap legacy, which is 2007 was the release of DD Crow, probably one of the most important uh, milestones. Um, yep. and then we're going to be moving on to the 2012 era. We saw a lot of cards there that were um, used from the hand being a very common part of the metagame. Gores, Tragodia, Effect Veiler, and <laughs> you know the one. Um, we're going to be talking about the concept of hand traps in general. Do we think that they are a good, healthy, commonplace part of the game? Looking at 2018, we've got the Ghost Sisters and Impermanence, and this is where we see a big change in the metagame of Yu-Gi-Oh! and how hand traps have evolved. Uh, then we've got some miscellaneous categories. We were specifically going to talk about Nibiru, because it's a bit more of a unique hand trap in and of itself. We've got the uh, mm -hmm. Floodgate hand traps as well. Uh, yeah. That is probably worth discussing. And then, of course, we have to talk about the most important hand trap, the elephant in the room. So we, he's got a little dedicated section. We're going to be talking about... Uh, Gokibori, or Gokibo, what, what, how do you say it in Japanese? I don't, I don't remember. Anyway. Maxi. <laughs> that one. All right. Uh, so, old man, you want to start us off with the uh, very first part of the game? Like, when hand effects were uh, started off, I, I guess, like, Karibo is really uh, where it begins? I, I guess I can, I can start you off with that, yeah. I mean, uh, I guess the very first one, Battle Hand Trap you were referring to, must be Karibo, right, that you're talking about, yeah. I mean, I think that was like the only quote-unquote viable hand trap you could ever play back in 2004 and or 5. it was sometimes played. I want to say, um, if you look at the history of hand traps, and we're going to obviously go through the different stages, I think you can clearly tell what the reasoning behind them making the cards was, I feel like. Uh, and the initial thing that I think was the case for something like Karibo or even something like later on, you know, G Gores and Tragodia, those kind of battle hand trap sort of things, battle fader, is another big one, Swift Scarecrow, right? Um, I think the reason for those would be that, of course, that was a time of, you know, you had to balance how much back row would you play into something like a Heavy Storm or a Giant Trunade. But as decks got more and more, you know, explosive, you would still want to feel safe at some point, right? And so that was, I think, the original reasoning to introduce cards like Tragodia, Gores, and initially Karibo to your decks, right? To, um, to feel safe even without having four back row in front of you, right? Because it would, there was a real chance at some point through, during those days that, like, you know, cards like Judgment Dragon would drop uh, after a heavy storm or, like, Dark Arm Dragon, and you couldn't rely on just trap cards to get you through the turn. Um, and I, that, that was the one thing. I remember Karibo seeing play at, like, the local scene that I was playing back then uh, to to counter decks like the the Cyberstein OTK sort of decks, right, that would focus on, you know, trunade your back row, then summon a cyber twin dragon or something like that, you know, and Karibo was a pretty good counter to that. I uh, think it's really interesting because, like, you know, one of the earlier hand traps, you know, we're going to obviously get onto this was, like, you know, things like Valor and stuff like that. We've seen mm -hmm. these evolve, right? Like, Valor kind of became yep. impermanence. We had Ghost Mourner, and obviously Valor mm -hmm. is still played in and of itself. Um, but yep. battle hand traps, um, I don't think I've changed that much, right? Like, they've kind of stayed the same. I suppose, like, Gores is, like, the big one we'll talk about. I, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know, because nowadays you don't really pay attention to them, right? It's possible that they printed some that are actually better than the old ones. But I, I, you wouldn't even remember, honestly, because, like, they just aren't that relevant anymore. Right. Yeah, so like it, it's it's weird because we still play like all of the sort of main phase hand traps a lot, but the battle ones have sort of faded out, right? We've I mean, got yeah, so many. Like the, yeah, yeah, like uh, Gores was like a big one. Honest, for example, was yeah. huge when Light Swords were a thing, right? Uh, oh but yeah, nowadays, the, the, like... the attack, the attack, the damage calc ones are also a big deal. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, and we literally got Dark Honest. We got Liar, and no one has played that from what I've I've never yeah. seen that in a deck list, right? And yep. why is that? What I guess just the battle phase isn't as important. 
I guess, as the main phase, right? That's like, the one thing. Yeah. The other thing is what I mentioned earlier. Like the reason why those cards were originally printed or looked after, right, is because they allowed you to have a more stable board position without having to set or play a whole bunch of trap cards, right? Um, which allowed for you to have a more secure position within the game, right? But like because in a game that goes over multiple turns anyways, like there's an argument to be made that's, that a card like DD Crow, right, that uh, that was printed at, in 2007 um, and was occasionally played, but for the most part, you know, you have to have a good reason to not play a trap card over a hand trap, right? When the, Because when the turn, when the, when the game lasts multiple turn anyways, most of the trap cards have more impactful effects than a hand trap, right? And so that reason at the time would be, well, heavy storms in the game. So if I have, a gores in my hand and one trap card i'm more i'm safer than if i just set two cards because then i risk going minus one into a heavy storm and having no backup anymore we'll uh see if battle hand traps ever really become a uh a thing in modern Yu-Gi-Oh. um they would need think... to be incredibly powerful they would essentially i think the already the first thing that a battle hand trap would need to have would be it it would have to be impossible to negate it because that's the biggest deal about any any sort of battle hand trap nowadays. Like, in theory, you could think, like, oh, if I just have one more turn, maybe I could come back. But the thing is, most people going for, like, an OTK would have the ability nowadays to set up Appaloosa or Baron or something of that sort before they, you know, that's why it's that, that's why it needs to be main phase nowadays, right? Because otherwise, well, you know, if my opponent gets to clear my board and go to the battle phase, then they probably can make an Appaloosa or whatever. Have you heard of the card Goddess of Sweet Revenge? Oh yeah, that's cool. I've I've tried playing that in Master Duel once. I think I I had a stream where I tried to resolve that card once uh, in some of those event in some of the Master Duel event. Yeah, there. Uh, that is uh the level of uh power that hand traps are gonna need to be viable if they're just gonna well, be battle that traps. Well, level of power minus the minus the activation the requirement thing where you have to control like no cards and literally it's the only zero. card in your hand, right? Yep, zero cards. It's it's kind of yeah. crazy. Um, but yeah. yeah um battle traps i think have sort of just faded out right they kind of peaked yeah. with things like honest and gores which we will uh talk mm -hmm. about once we get to 2012 in just a moment yeah. but um yeah you mentioned dd crow 2007 was the release date i think this was like probably where we see like the first milestone the first marker and card design oh. of like hey oh. this is a thing now right like you have yeah. to kind of think about this and there was a couple of relevant decks you know like it was very good against frog decks um frog yeah. ftk specifically which i think was that was a nine ten it was Frog FTK uh, won Worlds in 2010. That's when Ronin Toting came out, my boy. Uh, give it back. Um, yeah. But the... Yeah, no, DD Crow has been a good card right off the bat. That's how good it really is. I mean, it's still keeping... It's still seeing play today, which not that many cards can, can say that. Um, but DD Crow, like I said earlier, had to fight this battle of, you know, would I rather have a, a real trap card or would I rather have DD Crow? Because DD Crow, by design, is still a minus one, right? Because you're, like, discarding it from your hand to interact with a card in the graveyard. So it's, it's per se, not a, not an insane card, card advantage-wise. Uh, so just the ability to interact with your opponent's graveyard was good. But at, um, at early in the early days when the game was still usually consistent of multiple turns and there wasn't as much weight on the first turn of the game, you still needed good reason to play it over a, a real trap card or other cards, um, which was usually the case when it came to, I mean, obviously FTKs, but it was already seeing play against like stuff like, you know, the Dark Decks with Destiny or Militias. Um, Light Sworn was another deck that had a heavy focus on the graveyard, right? It's right around that time where the graveyard became increasingly more important as well. Like, that's a similar kind of situation with, like, you know, all the zombie decks that were triggered by, like, the release of Plague and, and Goblin Zombie, um, the Dark Arm decks that were heavily reliant on the graveyard, the Malicious, Light Swords, all that, right? It's really an era where the graveyard really comes into, comes into play a lot more than in previous uh, formats. Yeah, hitting a Plague Spreader when your opponent uses the effect for cost yeah. is, uh, whew, that feels good. And that's um, a matter of even there weren't that many trap cards that could even like do that, right? Like that was actually something that DD Crow had over actual trap cards that graveyard interaction was not super duper common. Oh, we didn't have call bar? The, no, you you would <laughs> you wouldn't believe it. No, that 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 card didn't exist back then. It was good times. Crazy to think Callby is like five years old now, but it was like 2018, I think Callby is when we saw it. But yeah. Uh, I want to say 2018. Yeah, we definitely had it during Sky Strike, early Sky Striker and Goki days. So yeah, 2018, I think. Which reminds me, we are gonna have to like talk about Call By specifically once we get into mm -hmm. the later parts because yeah. that is a very 
sort of part and part key point of uh, the, the discussion when hand traps is the counters. Um, but would you say DD Crow is like probably one of the first absolutely like mandatory cards around about like, I guess like 2010, right? Like you had to put that in your side at least. It was definitely very popular. There was a lot of decks that that didn't play it. So mo mostly it was it was basically the question was, did your deck struggle with the matchups that DD Crow was really good in? You know, there are certain decks, for example, if you look at Edison format, there is a couple decks that struggle with the Frog Monarch matchup, for, for example. And then obviously you would throw that card into your deck um, or your side deck, right? And then there's other decks that don't have a big problem with that matchup and then you, you're not going to play, right? It's a, it's a very much like... You look at the decks in the format, you identify which which decks you have a problem with, and then you put side deck cards uh, against those matchups into your deck, right? And DD Crow was part of the of those cards that would go first first thing you would put into your deck if you think of decks like uh, Treeborn, the use that Treeborn Frog or whatever. Then you would you would you would think of Crow usually first thing, you know. I'm trying to think if there was any other um, utility that Crow offered, because uh, you know one of the, like the cool things with like the Ghost Sisters is like you know during that Hulk mm -hmm. era, for example, everyone was playing a bunch of hand traps, but you could just genuinely normal summon Ash Blossom, and that would make Hulk a five racks, right? Um, yeah, I don't think DD Crow. I think the, ever did the only thing like I, I can think of with DD Crow was that it was an allure target and a crush card target. That was one um, sort of special thing about dd Ooh, crow it was card. a very easy way like i remember during early dark armed and crush card days that was sort of like the package that you would play in order to fit crush card into your deck to have enough dark monsters for it you'd play like sangan spirit reaper a couple dd crows and that would be enough to justify running crush card because obviously i mean if you had the money for crush card you wanted to use it because of how powerful it was and and dd crow was one of the easiest way to make sure you have enough darks for that Good uh, catch as well by Twitch chat. Like you could use it to discard and just manipulate your dark count for dark. Exactly. Arm. That's, yeah, uh, that too. Like manipulate. Like if you needed a third dark or you needed one dark for a chaos sorcerer, like it was very easy to just DD crow something and put it there. Fifth monster for avarice is something that comes up. There's a there's a couple of um, instances where just being able to put a monster into the graveyard is relevant. Yeah, for sure. We move into where I think the uh, next major milestone is of uh, mm -hmm. hand traps here. We can talk about each one of these uh, individually. But around the 2012 era of the game, we start to really see that, hey, hand traps are now like a real thing. This isn't just sort of like a niche thing that you do with like DD Crow. We now have like Effect Veiler. This is like a very real card that you can play that will stop your yeah. opponent's tour guide. Uh, mm -hmm. Gores and Tragodia, very, very popular in the format. And of course, Maxi which we will be dedicating a section for later to talk about specifically. But we see yep. that this is like a common theme now. This is like something that is happening more often in the game. Yeah. This is definitely around the time where I would argue it was also a good idea to make a card like Effect Veiler. Um, because it was around that time where the game is really picking up more and more steam, right? Between... Um, like the release of, you know, 2009, 2008, you think of like Dark Armed and Light Sworn releases, like the first really explosive decks. And then we go into this more modern era in 2011, 2012, where more and more decks are like this that can have like relatively explosive turns. And uh, we still have cards like Cold Wave in the game. That was a very big deal around that time. And also like, I don't remember exactly, there were some formats where Heavy Storm was legal, uh, some formats, Giant Tuna is legal, some format, all of them are legal. Like, not exactly sure which one is which, but for the most part, you had some ways to get rid of the entire back row, right? Even something like Trap Stun was seeing play, right? And so just relying on traps to counter explosive strategies wasn't really great, right? And so something like Effect Mailer felt really good um, because obviously, like Gores and Tragodia, while being good cards still, would still require like they wouldn't really interact with your opponent. They would just stop them from killing you, right? That that was not always the same value. Sometimes you just wanted to stop the effect actually instead of just not dying, you know? And Effect Veiler was one of the first cards that did that. At that time, I would still argue that it wasn't so much about turn zero, right? Because that is nowadays one of the main advantages of hand traps is that you can use it when your opponent goes first. Most of the time in 2011, 2012, effect veilers, I mean, you could use them uh, early on, but usually you would try to hold it for like a powerful turn when your opponent commits to that cold wave, right? And then you can like veiler that Xaber Fall Troll or veiler that Infernity Archfiend or Necromancer after they use the trap stun, those kind of things, right? That's, that's what effect veilers is really good to have a solid board position that can't simply be blown out by a heavy storm or something like that um so it was very much still an era where the game was designed to be played over multiple turns and you would try to 
have more defense on that one turn where your opponent would try to like go big or go home, right? I'm really curious, like, how much of Effect Veiler's card design was made in context of, like, hey, this is probably a good idea to design for the game, and how much it's tied in with the anime. Because Effect mm -hmm. Veiler is very, I mean, I wouldn't say iconically, but there is a very, very, like, you know, big kind of scene and duel in 5Ds where you say go second, and his opponent has this gimmick where he wins on the first turn. Um, and or we see the first ever... That's what that's called, okay. Huh? The gimmick is what they call that. The <laughs> yeah. Well, that was the uh, that was the scene, right? <laughs> um, and then the whole point is like he has this big reveal. He plays effect yep. Veiler. Um, we've ne we've never seen that uh, happen before. Um, yep. God, I can't believe my Keck W channel point redemption went off there. Sorry, <laughs> listeners. That was... <laughs> apologies. Uh, but yeah, the uh, the effect <laughs> Veiler is is used and i just think it's interesting because cards come from the anime right and then they design it into the game mm -hmm. so i'm just wondering like is that a coincidence like is I it mean, just yeah, like, maybe you know maybe it's a coincidence maybe it had something to do with each other but maybe they just thought like hey it'd be hype if we made this sort of plot twist where someone in the in the in the anime has a way to try and win on the first turn of the game and we give our protagonist the card to interact with that and that's like a really hype moment because like it's not known beforehand really and everyone is going to think like, oh, how can how can the protagonist win uh, if the opponent's going first and trying to win immediately? Uh, and there you go, you know, this card is this card lets you do that. Card um, in the hand. Yeah. So the uh, the other hand traps of this time is um, that are quite commonplace are like we see these battle hand traps evolving into yep. like these very very scary relevant pieces that until today, you know, like until today, people will just naturally by habit <laughs> attack with lowest to highest, you know, because you don't want to do trigger this. that Gore's token. I do this still most of the time, yeah. Yeah, so... Um, yeah. And they were relevant cards as well. Uh, they yeah. were very, very impactful. And even so far as I... Okay, so I did do a video on this. Um, and I, I think Gores was, like, banned on release of the TCG, like, release of Gores or something like that. Or, like, limited and or something like that. Limited. Yeah. No, it's always been limited, yeah. Yeah, Gors, okay, there you back go. Back in the day, Gores was never at three. So it was released at one. That's yeah. how uh, big and how huge of a sort of meta threat Gores was that you, yeah. like, Konami, like, put this card to one and we got it in the TCG. It was released at one copy, which is crazy to think. Some of, some people listening might not know this or might not be aware of this. It was very common pre-2013 for cards yeah, this is, to be released. This is something I'm not sure if it's because we still had the same... We did. We had the uh, joint ban list that was split yeah. between um, OCG and TCG in 2013 is when the split happened. Yeah, because they did. I'm not sure if it was the same for the OCG, like if Gores also released at one for them, or if it was just a matter of, you know, Gores was out for the OCG, you know, for a while, and they eventually put it at one, and then we got it, and so it was already at one. I don't know if it was an issue of they knew the card was going to be so strong that they even limited it right off the bat in the OCG, but it was for sure limited really, really fast, even for, for their standards. Um, and this just ties in with this other, like the, the the thing that I mentioned previously, like that's the, t that's around the time where decks became really explosive, not necessarily on the first turn, but like a lot of the decks around that time where you would see play with Gors and Tragodia, I mean, all the way until 2013, really like within mono mermail and stuff like that. I still remember playing Gors and Tragodia, even dragon ruler format, you play hand traps like Swift Scarecrow, right? Like, or sometimes battle fader, even just the ones that stop your opponent from winning the game in that particular turn because it was a really common practice for decks in that time to um to to assemble resources over a couple turns and then just try to explode on one turn whether it's by the help of heavy storm trap stun whichever card you can think of there's a multitude of, of ways to deal with the back row for this for the one turn right and then just try to push through right and and that's when they realized you know or like when the players realized you know not having an answer to that is just not great. And so like cards like Effect Villa, Gore's Drag, um, sometimes DD Crow, sometimes Battle Fader, sometimes Swift Scarecrow would um, really start seeing a lot of play. And then there was this other entire category of decks even that were trying to take advantage of the popularity of, of cards like Heavy Storm by just not playing any spell and traps at all, right? And those would be like, okay, um, you, I don't want to. I don't want to play into your back row removal. You know, if you ever draw MST or or heavy storm against me, I want it to be completely dead. But I still don't want to be completely defenseless, right? And so they gave them another way to do that. Yeah, and I think it's also interesting that Gorz's utility can't be understated as well because there was uh, a lot of uh, level one tuners at the time. 
And, mm -hmm. you know, I don't think coincidentally, Gores summons itself and the token as level sevens. Uh, and so you could synchro with the um, with the uh, token or Gores himself and yeah. you can make things like Stardust, which was like actually a really, really um, annoying boss monster to deal with in the time. And so, yeah. you know, you had things like uh, Glow Up Bulb. I think Spore was level one as well. Um, it was like a whole bunch of level one tuners that were good at the time. Normal summon effect veiler, you could do that as well. You could make yeah, a, even that. Make I mean, that's I'm 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 always one of the biggest fans when cards have like multi purpose, and I think it's funny because I think the reason why they made effect veiler a tuner, like for one, obviously to promote the synchro summoning mechanic, but I can also imagine that because it was one of the first of its kind, and they designed it in a way where effect veiler, similar to DD Crow, is also a minus one, right? It doesn't get rid of the card that it negates most of the time. Mm -hmm. Your opponent summons a monster, you effect veiler, you go minus one. I'm not sure how strong they thought effect veiler was going to be, right? And in, in initially, like nowadays, we know it's very strong, but like back in the day when it was the first of its kind, I can imagine they were like, what, why don't we give this card another purpose just to make sure it's good enough, right? Because maybe if, if we don't give it any purpose, then uh, it might not be strong enough. I'm not sure, but maybe. I think one of the most like funny things you can do is look at like historical uh contextual opinions to player reactions and reception yeah. for things like this. Like I have a bunch of screenshots until today still of like the release of, for example, Pot of Desires and people talking about how terrible it is and how it like gets rid of all your resources. So it'd be really funny to look back on Effect Veiler because I think you would probably have a lot of people on something like Pojo if you were to go b far enough to check out the archives i'm sure there would be a lot of people talking about how like this card is terrible it's a minus one you know to like be fair though i mean nowadays part of desires back at three and it's usually an exception if a deck is able to play it because of how modern decks like rely on single searchable cards and all that you know and like a special thing if your deck is able to play desires nowadays because the drawback with how modern Yu -Gi -Oh is being played actually comes into play obviously the whole minus nine meme is still uh, incredibly uh, incorrect, but um, yes, Desires that's does have a drawback. Out that's why opinion. it's not in every deck. I, yeah, it's it's one of those things where it's like, um, you know, I, that's a different topic of like power creep and stuff, and just how much yeah. engine requirement there is today. But yeah, um, mm -hmm. I think it'd be very interesting to see just how uh, people saw these things on release uh, and what they thought of things oh, like yeah. Effect yeah, Veiler. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you can you can tell by the reception of Effect Veiler that it was respected as a good card right away. I'm pretty sure. Like, I'm I, I think it came out right around like I want to say it's like um, Tango Plant format right before that, right? Duelist Revolution, I think, is the set, and um, it was played right away, right? But because people immediately saw the potential of like, okay, there's these decks in the format that everyone's playing like cold wave or other stuff you know there's like there's there's tango plant which has huge explosive turns there's x saber that has huge explosive turns that's even x saber might even be slightly before tango plant where effect Lilla was already out um but either way people knew that not completely relying on back row to stop the opponent was a good idea um plus the fact that you know most decks were able to use it as a tuner worst case if you didn't need it I think this is a good opportunity now to take a pause here, and if we can take our minds to this sort of era and this sort of timeline, we can talk about, like, uh, conceptually, in terms of the design of uh, the cards themselves and what we think mm -hmm. of um, hand traps. Uh, I think that during this period of time, in this sort of stage of Yu-Gi-Oh!, I think these are, like, just really perfectly balanced, right? They're not overbearing mm -hmm. cards that really define the metagame. Even Maxi, right? Like, during this time, like, it was... I think fine. I think it was a balanced card for the most part. Uh, yeah, yeah. I I would not say that they didn't define the meta game because they did to an extent. They were very relevant to how you approached playing the game back in the day. It was very relevant. I but think I very think different that to is how it is today. Makes, at least I think that's what makes good card design is the fact that they were relevant, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and people did play them and actively had to play around them. But no one, at least to my knowledge or to my experience, no one ever thought of these as problematic cards at the time. Like there were, when you think of old formats, there's always cards where you think, okay, that card was maybe a little bit out of place, too powerful for that format. Like you think of like when Dark Armed Dragon was released or when Black Luster Soldier came off the ban list, Heavy Storm, Cold Wave, True Nate, like all of those are commonly referred to as like problematic cards at the time. Royal Oppression, you name it, right? Effect Veiler, Gors, Tragodia, Battle Fader, all those were totally accepted, even though they were all popular in different decks. You know, a lot of people played those cards. No one really thought they were a problem. They were all fine with them, right? And I think that's when 
you really know the design for the time was appropriate because like the cards were well received people liked them people played with them people mostly didn't complain about them because they were just everyone knew they were reasonable i feel like yeah and even something like uh maxi at this point in time um you can see like there was yeah. potentially like a lot of uh a lot of like misuses of maxi right like sometimes you know your opponent would summon tour guide and you would just immediately maxi and it's like there's an argument to be had where you know in a tengu plant mirror maybe that's mm -hmm. not correct to use immediately right yeah. like sometimes holding yeah. maxi for the push when they go for like the heavy storm or the big clear and they actually try and attack for game maxi mm -hmm. allows you to draw into things like uh gores for example you know and it was like a very um it was it was a lot more shall we say relaxed in terms of the hand trap metagame as you said it was like relevant but i don't think it was like you know, a massively defining aspect of, of how yep. the game works compared to where we are mm -hmm. today. So in terms of the design aspect of hand traps during this period, I think it's a very sweet spot. I think it's yep. just at its perfect um, kind of power level. Yeah, I would agree with that. That, that, that. Those are pretty good. Even Maxi in the beginning, like, wasn't even considered a staple in every single deck. Like, it took a, a while, but then people did realize it was a really good card. But it still, for the time, wasn't really uh, like referred to as a super problematic card, which is funny looking back at it from the day. But I suppose um, looking at Maxi from today's perspective is something we're going to do in a little bit. But um, I would, I would, I would agree with you that for that timing, um, hand traps were a very good idea, and they were well received, and the design was pretty good for almost all of them, or all of them. I can, I can't think of one that was a problem back in the day. The only one that actually undershot its target a little bit, which is funny because nowadays it's everywhere, is uh, Droll and Lockbird. Droll and Lockbird is actually that old, like that thing's from 2011. Um, but at the time, like it just wasn't a good card because of how little searching happened in a single turn. Right? It's funny how the how that focus has shifted. From like what I said earlier was usually you would use hand traps to just survive that one explosive turn at some point down the line. Nowadays it's just uh, Droll and Lockbird is used to end someone's turn completely, which just wasn't that big of a deal back then, right? So that's I think that's the only hand trap that I can think of right now that was genuinely like not well designed for its time. Can can you think of uh, another card from Star Strike Blast that just was uh, shall we say too behind its time? Behind its time. Yeah. Are you referring ahead to Maxi of its time, again, I guess, would what? be uh, the correct term. Wait, no, Maxi isn't isn't is Maxi Star Strike Blast? No, that's Storm of Ragnarok. Vanity's emptiness was in Star Strike. Oh, Blast. I thought you were referring to another hand trap. Okay, no, no, no yeah, no. you're right. Yeah, okay, yeah, no, absolutely. That, yeah, yeah, that yeah, set yeah. just had you. two of the most powerful oh, yeah. cards ever oh, made. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And no one knew at the time. Like people just <laughs> did not know. They were so unaware of how um, powerful that's a, that's those cards are. That's not a card name I was expecting to hear today. All right. Yeah. I was not ready for that. So shifting into the uh, latter part, I guess, of the era, and I kind of like, I suppose, where we are today, I think uh, a major milestone release um, is around about 2018. You know, I, I'm putting this together because there's sort of this like conjoining of like that kind of Master Rule 4 format um, and a little bit before as well was Maximum Crisis. We had the release of Ash Blossom and Joyous Spring um, and then a couple months go on, we have more of these Ghost Sisters being released, uh, some of which have definitely seen a lot of metagame usage. And on top of that, we see Infinite Impermanence. Oh, was Ogre first? Yeah, sorry. My yeah, bad. I wanted, Ogre, I wanted to first. say, I think the first Ghost Sister was Ghost Ogre and Snow Rabbit. Yeah, but during this thing period... was already out during like later Pendulum format. Like I, I want to say Ogre is 2015 or 16. Oh, even earlier than that? Okay, interesting. Oh. Because Ash is 2017. So I think around about 2018 is when all of this comes together because we've seen these yeah. slow iterations of hand traps being released. You know, we had Ogre, yeah. then we had Ash Blossom, Cyframe Gear Gamma was in there somewhere as well, which is um, no one really saw Gamma as a hand trap, I think, initially for the first couple of years, right? It was just that it was just a Cyframe card. And then eventually people are realizing, well, actually, we can play Gamma as a hand trap. But the point is, is that we're in this new age and new era of Yu-Gi-Oh!, uh, around about like 2017, 2018, where we are seeing hand traps as like, these aren't just kind of like, you know, mm -hmm. um, fun little sort of like one for one things. Like these are like commonplace things that are like, you're dropping like two of these in a turn sometimes. And that's like common. And this is happening it, regularly. Yeah, it, it does go hand in hand. I feel like with the development of the first turn getting increasingly more jam packed with more and more actions, right? And they are kind of like this natural answer to 
to that development where um, Yu-Gi-Oh has turned into, or slowly over time turned into this game where more and more is happening on the first turn, obviously because we don't have a sort of mana system that restricts how much you can do on the first turn. And then they realized, I suppose, that you know by default, by Yu-Gi-Oh's rulebook, turn zero is the least interactive turn, right? Because Yu-Gi-Oh by default, or like by the rules, is technically a really, really interactive turn with like trap cards and how quick play spells work and monster effects on the opponent's turn. The only problem is like turn zero, the the non-turn player doesn't get to commit any of those cards to the to the field yet, which wasn't ever a problem when the game was slower. But the faster the game became, the more important it was to be able to interact with your opponent on their very first turn, right? And maybe that's also why battle traps fell off because they wouldn't do exactly that, right? Effect Veiler and DD Crow, they would still be relevant because they did that, but Gores and Drag didn't didn't matter because they didn't have a battle phase. They all just did all their things on turn zero in the main phase, and um, they yeah that that's that's where more and more hand traps came in, right? That's where they gave us more and more of these sort of ways to interact with our opponent in different ways. Do you know what I mean? The first thing was Ghost Ogre. I think after Ghost Ogre, it, it's um, Ghost Winter Cherries. I think is 2016. I think that's before Ash even. Yeah, and then the I ABC think the ABC Dragon Buster and stuff that was uh, that's what we were exactly. doing exactly. Yeah, and then and then in in 2017, 18, around that time that you mentioned, I think is where we see just like a a lot of these released together because they're like, okay, this game is getting more and more focused around the first turn, and we need to give people tools to interact with the opponent to make sure that you know, and we need to give them more than just one, right? Because they need to be suitable for different situations, and maybe you need to play multiples to make sure you see one um, or even two, right? And that's where really generic ones came in, right? They gave us Imperm to make sure we can play technically like six effect veilers. Um, we, like Ash Blossom, I think is at that time or even to today, the best generic hand trap in terms of its, not even, not in its impact most, a lot of the time, unless you're playing against like a branded player or something like that, but like the, the, the what's the word? The versatility for Ash Blossom is I think what really makes it like a, an all-time evergreen staple for, for Yu-Gi-Oh! and mo a lot of years to come probably um, because it was like astounding how it was good against like every single deck, right? I think uh, I've always uh, stood by the fact that ever since its release in 2017, there's probably an argument that Ash Blossom has been in a deck list potentially permanently ever since its release, like even at the very minimum in the side and I think that's uh, true for almost probably like 90% of the formats we've had over the last like, how long has it been now? Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's almost years? seven years. I don't know exactly. Yeah, I don't years? know the exact months for months like just for yesterday maximum that crisis. Came out, dude. Oh my god. I, maximum crisis must be like towards the what is it? Middle 2017, I think. Yeah. So it has. It's not an auto include in every single deck. Like I've played um, without Ash since its release, like a couple times. But at the same time, I mean, the it is incredibly popular. Probably, I want to say, since its release, the most plays, the most played Yu-Gi-Oh card overall. I think I I don't think another card really comes close with how how much it's played since its release. I think if you were to like. Um ever have you know uh you know there's like cards that define and are iconic in Yu-Gi-Oh. you think of like blue eyes and dark magician i think if you were yeah. to think of like iconic competitive Yu-Gi-Oh cards there's yeah, like awesome. in my mind it's like mystical space typhoon up to like 2013 ish maybe even more and then after mm -hmm. that in modern Yu-Gi-Oh, like i think ash is the like kind of iconic card you know because it's always yep. just been in and out of every format it's so popular it has like one of the highest usage rates outside of, you know, the man. Um, and I think it's just such a such a huge impact on the game. Um, yeah. You know, so we had Ash Blossom, uh, Infinite Impermanence. Uh, and I think it's very interesting as well. Because uh, I think Cyframe Gamma is a really um, weird one. Because I don't know how much the intention was for Gamma to be played generically. Uh, I don't think it was meant to be that, honestly. Because Gamma came out during a time where this whole sort of thing, where nowadays it's a very common practice to play like three copies of a card that requires one sort of like semi-brick or full brick in your deck, or maybe six copies of a card that require one brick in your deck. 
um, like engine requirements is a way more common thing nowadays, right? Like it wasn't completely unknown back in the day. Like you would, you would obviously, you can think of like the early days, you know, brilliant fusion with a garnet in your deck or something like that, right? But like it wasn't as common. And I, th I think it genuinely was just meant to be for the Cyframe deck. Like I don't think that the designers of Gamma anticipated people being quote unquote mad enough to throw that vanilla in every deck right they thought hey i'm just we're just going to make a deck designed around not having monsters on the board at any time and we're going to give them a more powerful hand trap as quote unquote like a reason to play that deck right um and that obviously didn't work out because no one has ever played high frame because of gamma existing like it's just gamma in other decks right which by the way i'm not a i'm not a big fan of gamma i'm i'm, I'm never a fan of cards that make me play bricks in my deck i just i just don't like that it's a good card but i'm not not a fan of the of the concept I will admit that some of my most uh, hype and fun moments have always been like hand trap wars involving Gamma and being able to resolve Gamma, get that body on your own turn. Oh, it, it's, I mean, it's a very good and very hype card in that sense, right? But it, nothing, there's nothing that says you can't create a card that feels like that, that doesn't have to play a vanilla in your deck, right? Yeah, like, of I, course. I think I just hate the feeling of drawing driver and I hate that Gamma sometimes feels necessary and is so good that I feel inclined to put that card into my deck, especially right now when, like, in Master Duel, the card is semi-limited, so I'm getting an even worse deal out of it, like, statistically, right? It's just, like, I have two Gammas in my deck, not even the full three, and sometimes sometimes because of how good Maxi is, for example, I'm still forced, or I feel forced to play that card in my deck, which I just really don't want to. Um, and that's just, to me, I don't associate that with good card design when I'm, I'm feeling forced to play a card because it's that powerful, but I don't actually feel good for putting it into my deck, right? Well, I mean, you know, originally it was intended to be used as a synchro summon, so uh, that's, uh, if you really want to risk the, ga uh, risk the, ga risk the uh, Garnet, then, you know, you do get the uh, serotonin of making a level 8 synchro monster for free. I, yeah, I know, time. and that feels good, but I think it also feels bad a lot of the time. So there's a, a, a huge uh, shift as well here that we see the release of one of the most uh, important cards uh, alongside the hand traps. And it's because the hand traps are becoming so prolific and relevant and impactful in the metagame to the point that, well, Konami decided to print Called by the Grave during this time. Oh, yeah. The Call by the Grave is a quick play spell card that negates a uh, graveyard effect um, and uh, shuts it off for two turns, by the way. Just, you know, mm -hmm. I, I don't know why it needed that as well, but I guess that was sort of a balancing act. But the point is, uh, they see hand traps being dominant and they create a card to counter it. And, um, well, I think uh, Call by is also a pretty, uh, a card that has a lot of strong opinions from some people, shall we say. It... It really goes to show that in design space, in a card game like Yu-Gi-Oh, where there's no rotation, there is a lot of these sort of cycles that um, once you look back at it a couple of years later, it's just it just becomes really, really obvious how how it, how it works essentially in in I feel like in their minds when they're designing those sort of cards because they rec they recognized the format is getting faster and faster. The first turns are becoming more and more important. So we're going to give players tools to combat that, right? And they did by, by giving us like a couple of very solid hand traps that made their way into, into people's decks, right? And then all of a sudden, uh, a large portion of, of decks or some decks rather would not be able to, to push through that, right? Or like people that were playing, uh, maybe we're, play we're more interested in playing combo decks or something like that, we're complaining about like how I, I don't have ways to to stop those traps from, from stopping me from playing because around 2018 is where we hit that sort of critical mass of, you know, if you really want to, you can play like three Effect Veiler, three Ash, three Imperm, uh, even DD Crow or Bell if it's good or Ogre, you know, like you can hit like numbers of two digits hand traps, right, to stop your opponent. And some decks were not equipped to deal with that. And so... They made Called by the Grave, which I'm very split on Called by the Grave. Like, sometimes I think it depends on the format. I just think that if you if you think hand traps are necessary for the game, I always find it annoying when Called by exists. Like, whenever, whenever hand traps feel necessary in a format, I hate Called by. Because the, the first turn, like I said earlier, is already the least interactive turn in the game of Yu-Gi-Oh!, Taking away that little bit of interaction from your opponent when you're going first, it just doesn't feel right to me. 
Um, the only times where where I when I've been a fan of cold buy is when it's in like slower formats where hand traps aren't that important. Like uh, I remember at, at its first release, I played three copies of cold buy in like sky striker decks. And there it never felt that toxic because it was like, yeah, I'm like trying to force my engage through an Ash Blossom, but it's not like the game ends after I do that, right? I have a very strong opinion on Call By. I think the card is is, is ban worthy. I don't think that card oh, should yeah. have ever been made. No, I, I agree with that. I think it's uh, really broken. Um, and I'll lay out some of the reasons in a try. I'll try TLDR it. Um, I think that Call By the Grave um, is... Basically, I see it as an I win button, and we saw this really come into uh, come into its own during Goki format, where Goki players oh, yeah. were maining, like, I, I think they were maining call by or even siding. Oh, yeah, like no, three, absolutely. Right? Like, it was a staple, yeah. So you you have a deck that was so toxic. Some of, One of the worst, like, designed, like, combo decks was, like, it would rip your hand for, like, two, and then again on two, uh, for two on your, on your turn. It would set up, like, this crazy... Uh, ridiculous field that was just unoutable um, and you just can't play the game, right? So you need yeah. hand traps to stop that. Um, and then if they draw call by, well, they're just deleting a hand trap and their literal two-card combo just gets through. It's just any two warriors make his old day is full combo. Um, and I think that's really toxic. Um, and yeah. I don't think uh, call by should be in a game that allows you to just have an I win button like that. Now, conversely, the argument against that is that, well, um, I need my hand. Tra I, I need my play to go through. If I normal summon Magellan, you know, a rogue deck, Ma Madoche, like that doesn't do anything crazy, like toxic or overly broken. Turn one. Um, if they just uh, if they call by that, I kind of just lose the game uh, unless I've just hard drawn Petting Sessor as an example, right? Yep. And people argue that call by is necessary for the rogue decks to do well. The mm -hmm. problem is like. Well, what if the combo decks, what if the meta decks are drawing call by in those situations? Yeah. Now they're just yeah. even more powerful. So I think the problem isn't that rogue decks need call by. It's that hand traps are a band-aid or a problem and rogue decks kind of get shot down in the crossfire. That's kind of like... Yes, that, and that is a theme that we're going to revisit a couple times when we're talking about different like individual cards that are still up for debate. But call by specifically, I think is another... Like what you've described there is essentially like the the question of when Goki has called by at its at its disposal to do toxic things, right? Is is called by the problem or is Goki the problem? And in this particular example, I would still think that Goki is more of a problem than called by, right? Like it's basically called by itself in what it does isn't that powerful of a card. It's just that it enables other strategies that are too powerful and should probably not exist in the first place. Still, historically speaking, of course, these sort of things, they pop up every now and then in Yu-Gi-Oh! It's just something that, you know, apparently it's not something that they can predict or prevent. Uh, like, it, it just happens. And every time it does happen, Cold by becomes a huge problem. And so it's it's a dangerous game to play with Cold by being in the mix, right? Because, um, like, uh, basically it goes, it, it circles back to this whole thing, you know, if, if a mid-range deck has called by, like wh what I said earlier with Sky Striker, or what you said with Medolce or whatever, I wouldn't have an issue with that, it's just a problem that it's a much too powerful tool for the combo decks, um, which I mean, if we had an entire episode on combo decks, like in my opinion, those just shouldn't exist and if they limited the ability of combo decks then I'd theoretically be fine with called by the grave, but in practice, you know, that's just not really happening, uh, so... Man traps are a necessary evil for that, and then uh, called by. I I don't think it it should be possible to mess with hand traps in that, at the level that called by does at least. Kind of moving on to like the uh, next topic here, which sort of ties into uh, called by in some respect. Um, during this time, we see the design of uh, hand traps that don't interact with called by. Um, mm -hmm. Gamma Gamma was released earlier, but it's getting a little bit more popular now during this time, I think. Um, and that can't be called by. Um, and one of the most iconic hand traps in the game is Nibiru. That is a card you can't call by. Um, so yeah. I don't know if they did that on purpose with things as well. With Infinite Permanence, it's a trap card. You can't call by it. Um, so it's like we created call by to like power creep the hand traps and then we're making more hand traps to power creep the call by. And this is the are. cycle that I, meant, that I talked about earlier. Yeah, that's what I meant. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and here we are with Nibiru, released in 2019, um, and one of the most iconic design shifts we've seen, which is three promotional cards for the Megatons, was Nibiru, Shifter, yeah. Dart Ruler, cards mm -hmm. very, very specifically designed to deal with combo decks. 
that's a topic that we've already been over, but we're going to talk yeah. about Nibiru here and mm -hmm. the sort of design aspect of Nibiru. This was, Creating a card like Nibiru is a bold move, isn't it? I I think so, yeah. But at the same time, I, I think I said this before when we I think in the combo deck episode, my, my tinfoil hat theory. I think Nibiru was designed by the TCG as like a replacement for Maxi. Um because uh, we have this sort of problem as well when it comes to Yu-Gi-Oh! archetype design, right? The OCG sometimes they I I feel like they design archetypes specifically around Maxi. Like sometimes they'll make archetypes that are notoriously good into maxi and make your opponent's maxi feel completely dead like flu and sometimes they will make incredibly powerful archetypes that are super combo heavy with the idea that well they can't maxi so they can't beat maxi so their win rate is going to be fine overall right that's i'm thinking of something like super heavy samurai where the deck can't use called by or cross out by design and so it's usually going to lose to maxi so that was kind of their justification for why super heavy samurai was made and even existed for such a long time in the OCG. Um, and the problem in that case is that whenever they make an archetype like that, right, and they have Maxi to, to deal with it, and then the TCG doesn't have Maxi because they're based individuals, apparently, in that regard. Um, but then those archetypes come over here still, right? It's not like they can select, oh, well, that's too dangerous. We don't want that. We still get those cards. Uh, and I think at some point the TCG was just like, now nah, we need we need something that's not Maxi uh, to to combat that. And I think that's why that specific tin was made because it's not just Nibiru; it was Shifter and Dark Ruler at the same time, all three together. Yep, summarized pretty well. Um, I think that um, Nibiru is uh, it's it's weird because it's supposed to be like the the entire purpose of Nibiru is like it's it's like the shift right where it's um, you know a Veiler, an Ash Blossom, a Ghost Ogre, a Ghost Mourner. Like those cards are not designed to end your turn. Uh, but I think yeah. Nibiru was very much like, hey, listen, you're uh, you're getting out of control over there, buddy. So uh, here's a rock. Yeah, you know, that, that's kind of yeah. like I think what mm -hmm. the the purpose of it. It's supposed to be this game turn ending card. And again, it's like an arms race between the card design of the power creep. It's like, okay, well, yeah. Nibiru's in the game, so now we need to like make decks that can beat Nibiru, um, and then summon Apollo's on their fifth or Baron on the fifth summon, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So we've seen this like uh, development over the years, and I think that um, you know that's that's kind of going back to the other topic that we talked about in the previous podcast. But yeah, I just think it's interesting that Nibiru was made as a hand trap, and it's a very mm -hmm. huge, impactful hand trap when it hits at the right time, a game winning card, like an actual just turn ending game winning card um yep. if nibiru resolves like against a lot of decks like um it can just be the end especially against rogue decks and i think that's kind of where like oh, yeah. a lot of the frustrations with nibiru come from is like mm -hmm. meta decks are the are the co the meta combo decks are the decks that you know checkbox you have to be able to play through something like nibiru or droll right um yep. for, a, for a rogue combo deck like that's gonna be very hard to meet those cry to meet that criteria um it's definitely another one of those issues where Nibiru in itself, I actually am a fan of Nibiru's design as opposed to something like the shifter because I just think it was um, like the idea behind Nibiru, I think, was to replace Maxi without just being good every single time in every single matchup and auto win every single time, you know, because it does leave some room to play around it. The problem is you need a deck that can do it. And so Nibiru, while mostly viewed as like a necessary card and introduces some sort of skill into the the top level decks in the in the game, it it catches a lot of decks in the crossfire. Um, and ever since its introduction, it's been relatively popular. I suppose the only quote unquote um, good thing for rogue decks that lose to Nibiru um, it would be that the more decks they make nowadays that are good into Nibiru, there's like there's been formats where it wasn't that popular simply because they've designed decks that were good against it, and therefore Nibiru sort of fades in and out of the game sometimes. And then you can find openings in the format where Nibiru is not that popular, but like it still doesn't feel great, obviously, when you're already playing a rogue deck and then you also have to rely on your opponent not playing Nibiru. Um, but yeah, it's definitely a, a big switch up from that idea of, hey, we're making these sort of 1v1 hand traps, like, you know... Ash, Imperm, Valor, Crow, they all like discard me, I'm gone after, and I interact with one certain thing the opponent does. Like you look at something like Shifter or Nibiru, they're very different. They're more situational, but they are higher risk, higher reward, rather, should I say? No? Yeah. 
Uh, well, um, we've got uh, the next category of hand traps, and uh, we mentioned it earlier, Droll and Lockward is probably one of the first ever floodgate hand traps. Mm. Um, but then we've seen uh, some of them be designed, you know, again, like Shifter is part and parcel, that Nibiru kind of style era, and they were made in the same product. And then we also had Lancia was massively popular in 2019. Yeah. Um, hitting all kinds of decks, like, you know, specifically designed to beat Orcust, uh, it was pretty good against Thunder Dragon, uh, and even hitting random rogue stuff like Dino, it would just, like, completely end your turn. Um, yep. You know, Droll and Lockbird does the same against a lot of decks, um, which is, yep. you know, Droll is an interesting one, right? Because it was never, yep. all, it was not relevant at all for, like, years until the game got yep. kind of faster. Um, yep. But now we have a huge sort of... Uh, change up in the game i think is like that 2019 era where now we're we don't even see hand traps being traded with anymore we see people playing like a comp like total game ending hand traps like yeah yeah like the shifter like the um like the lancia and i mean i'm just gonna let the cat out the bag here like i think that's absurd like i i can't believe like that's okay like that was ever greenlit um or allowed to exist for so long i don't know if anyone else feels differently but it's absurd to me that turn zero you can just cancel someone's turn with a shifter like that that is absurd to me it, it is absurd and i will say in general i am just lingering conditions um i i think are just something that they should stop doing um like in general i think no matter which way you look at it whether it's a monster applying a lingering condition on your opponent's turn like scythe or calamity or if it's a spell or trap card that you have to work for to apply a lingering condition or if it's a hand trap that applies a lingering condition it's just never good for the game because it's even less interactive than like a floodgate that stays on the board because at least you can like imagine an out to that, right? You can be like, okay, well, you know, like I can at least per, per, like prepare for that in some shape or form, which doesn't make it okay, but at least it exists. For it's freaking a lot easier any to lingering sort of thing, any anytime a lingering effect is relevant, it's because it's way too powerful and way too toxic and turn ending. Um so cards like Shifter, I, I just hate Shifter. Joel and Lockbird, I, I also don't like Joel and Lockbird. However, out of this entire category of lingering effects, uh, Joel and Lockbird, to me, sometimes feels like a necessary evil. At least like in the, in the last couple of years, I feel like it goes back to this whole, like, what's the actual problem in that format? Because whenever Joel and Lockbird was relevant, it was usually because there was a couple, there were decks in the format that were incredibly toxic that forced people to use it. Like it's like um, most recently you have like Super Heavy Samurai, but like back in the day, the decks that prompted people to play Droll and Lockbird were like Danger FTK, Goki, Spiral. Uh, now it's Super Heavy Samurai. Like those are the decks that mostly prompt people to play Droll and Lockbird. And I would argue that most of the time when Droll's being played and specifically main decked, I think it's more that the decks that are around it are the bigger problem. Uh, at the same time, we are also experiencing a de like a development that is similar to the Maxi problem, where Maxi on release was kind of the same. It was a good card, but it was only game winning against like toxic decks. Drone and Lock, and then it developed into a game where now every every deck is is weak to Maxi, right? Um, I think we can see that as well, where like Droll and Lockbird for a period was only good against the toxic decks, but now we're starting to see this where Droll and Lockbird just becomes good against everything, right? Because decks are just interacting with the with their with the main deck a lot this, these days. Really interesting as well to note that um basically Droll is supposed to be maxi, right? Because we have abandoned the uh TCG. Um the next best card to really counter count uh, you know, sort of toxic combo decks is sort of Droll generally, right? Like mm -hmm. You know, Maxi would be great if you were playing against Manadium, but, you know, we don't have that. So, realistically, like, Droll is the best card um, in that yeah. kind of situation. Um, yeah. So, that's sort of, like, how it's sort of evolved, at least, I think, in the TCG for, mo for the most part. Um, yeah. But we've seen, like, some of the best combo decks in the game um, don't really care that much about Droll, right? Uh, so many, you know, quote-unquote toxic combo decks, like, uh, what's it called? Uh, Adam Anspader, right? Like, you search, I think, like once with your block dragon and then you you're just special summoning out of the deck yeah. constantly basically um yeah. so i think that's uh it's it's it feels really bad to uh see such a powerful deck you know and even right now um against snake eye i i don't think that's a deck you should be playing droll against um no and that's the thing that's what i mean that's why droll feels somewhat okay still uh or like okay yeah, it's just not as high impact. but like most of the decks that i personally find like quote-unquote healthy like the mid-range sort of things 
whenever those are on top of the of the format, like Droll isn't really that sick against them. Like it's not turn ending against a lot of the mid range decks that I like to play. It's like Droll really just most of the time only really works super well against the decks that I think don't have a place in the game anyways. And so in my book, it's like an answer to Super Heavy Samurai. I can live with that, you know? I can live with, like, if it's a Super Heavy Samurai that gets its turn ended by a Droll and Lockbird, I'm, I'm okay with that. But if it's a, if, if you think of, like, a turn-ending hand trap against, like, mid-range decks, then I think when it's problematic, when it ends every deck's turn. Like Shifter does, for example. Like, Shifter is, like, turn-ending for 90% of the, of the game. Yeah. All right. <sighs> Fine. We'll do it. We'll talk about... The one, All right. it's uh, it's important. <laughs> we gotta we gotta bring him in. We gotta tag him in here. So we we can't have a podcast. We can't have a discussion. We can't have any sort of debate or anything whatsoever without talking about the maxi, the uh, mm. hallmark, most important, uh, number one craft. If you're a new player in Master Duels, the first thing you make, the first thing you do is you pick up maxi, uh, yep. single most important card in the game, released in 2011. Uh, as a TCG exclusive, funnily enough, um, mm -hmm. was Storm of Ragnarok uh, Maxi. Uh, yep. This is a card that every time your opponent special summons, you get to draw. And over the years, we've mentioned a few times, Maxi hasn't really been that great because in a slower game, in a slower format where you can just go tour guide summon a Sangan pass and set a solemn judgment or something, like that was like you were safe, right? Uh, but as the game has progressed where the duels end on turn three, a lot of duels will just end on that, you know, second, play uh, second turn of the first player. Uh, it's... Mm -hmm. um, it's it's gotten to the point where do we think this card has overstayed its welcome? Is it a card designed from a different era, or do we think that there still is a place for the bug in this day and age? Um it's definitely overstayed its welcome. I think it's a matter of I actually would argue Maxi was a good design at the time. Because the idea behind Maxi was clearly they they noticed that some decks were starting to get out of hand and they wanted a way to punish that. And Maxi did that without, in the beginning, feeling too powerful. Like, it was a card that, in most matchups, you could get, like, your one draw out of it consistently. But usually, if that was your average, getting one draw, uh, that wasn't worth main decking. Like, people realized it was a good card against a couple specific, like, decks, right? Um, but for the most part, it was like a... Sometimes you mained one or two copies. Sometimes you only sided Maxi. Like, people knew it was good but it was only really good against like toxic strategies or two explosive strategies. Um, and I think one interesting thing about Maxi that gets overlooked now because of how it just ends the turn immediately, pretty much, right? The initial idea behind, hand, behind Maxi as a hand trap, I think is, is kind of interesting because it doesn't actually stop your opponent from doing anything, right? And I think that's an interesting concept that, um, that I think they should revisit Maybe, because I think that could be one way, you know, they could maybe, I guess we're going to talk about future hand trap design, but just to quickly, you know, preface that. The idea that a card benefits from your opponent committing a lot to the board without, like, doing anything to them, I think is fine. Like, is, is fine. Like, another one that I love, one of my favorite cards ever, is Phantasme. Like, Phantasme is another one of those cards that, like, when your opponent commits into it, you get card advantage out of it, but you're not stopping your opponent from doing anything, right? And Maxi did the same at the time. Obviously, like, it was more balanced when it was an option to just pass your turn without dying every single time, right? Yeah, and um, the, uh, the the whole point is, like, you know, you're, it's, it's a prevention met uh, method, right? Like, you're stopping your opponent yeah. from doing something. Um, and I guess, like... I do quite like the sort of kiss curse aspect of Maxi where it's like, okay, cool. Like you're not actually stopping me from playing. I can keep yeah. going. But the problem I think is like so many decks like need to special summon so much to even just do something very yeah. simple, right? Like I always use like, you know, Tri Brigade and Salmon Great as like an example yeah. where those decks, like they need to summon like a, a lot and they only yeah. really end on like two disruption in engine. Yeah. Um, and I think that's just, it's overly punishing. Um, it's the, why the card seen... is just too powerful because the game was different back then. Yeah, um, I, like even like regardless of where you are on on like the 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 side and the agreement, uh, sorry, the debate of like Maxi, you just have to think like in principle, 
does it re like one of the cool aspects of Yu-Gi-Oh is like it's nice when like Book of Moon is relevant again, right? Like it's like okay, this card from like twenty years ago is like relevant again. Econ, um, here's this like random niche card like Bullblader, randomly relevant in like Necros, right? Like it's cool when like random mm -hmm. things pop up like that. Um, but I think like when a card from you know two thousand eleven that is such a defining factor in every single duel, um, where you are playing cards so much so to like counter it. Regardless of if you think that's good or, or or bad, does it really make sense that a card from that long ago should be so pivotal? Uh, I I don't think it does. I think it's another matter of the idea behind Maxi is okay. The idea behind hey, we want to punish excessive special summoning. We want to punish combo decks, and the argument of hey, I'm afraid that if we get rid of Maxi, those decks would run rampant. All of those are reasonable reasonable things to say. Um, I just think that looking at it in practice, Maxi doesn't actually do that. Maxi pretty much wins almost every game that it resolves in, regardless of whether you're playing against an all-in combo deck or if you're playing against friggin' mid-range Cell of Mangrade, which is like balanced uh, as hell, right? Um, I think it's quite simple. I I would love Max for Maxi to be banned in every format, not just the TCG. And I would just, I would think they should just make a replacement, just make a, just design something that's more like adequate for for modern Yu-Gi-Oh, which I don't think is impossible. Like I said, they they have the means to to make other hand traps that give you, that generate card advantage uh, if your opponent summons into them or interact with your opponent in other ways. Like you, it doesn't always have to be like dimension shifter or anything like that. They 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 can make card like Phantasme is at one fant like fantastical uh, example uh, no pun intended but like that thing is also not I, th I think that card's not generic enough like i, I wish I, I wish we had more cards that like if if my opponent does too much you know i just get something out of it like i make going second a little bit easier i mean they've re they've retrained and redesigned pot of greed like into like seven different cards you yeah. know like there's so many ways to like you know if you really like pot of greed like there's lots of cards that kind of do the same thing in, in, in a slight roundabout way. Uh, why yeah. can't we have that with Maxi, right? Like, it's... Yeah. Uh, the, the community has come up with so many suggestions and ideas for how there's, you can make Maxi. There's a crazy amount of design space that they are just not exploring for hand traps. Like, it's, it's genuinely wild how... Um, like, they are exploring so many different ways to make different archetypes and different combos and all that kind of stuff. And, like, genuinely, I'm here even struggling to think when we got the last generic good hand trap nowadays because it's like there's been this huge peak like hand trap boom around 2018 2019 and then ever since it's like we got bestials which are very good cards but they are also kind of specific um but like the hand trap development like the hand trap design in the last couple of years for the most part has been incredibly disappointing outside of some like archetypal ones, like, you know, like a Kelbeck was good in the deck that it was played in, but it wasn't a generically good card. Havness, the same. Like, we're just not getting... The hand traps are not keeping up with the power creep. They're making they're making new archetypes that deal with the existing hand traps. You know, every, every archetype in the world that is top tier now uh, has a way to deal with Nibiru before five summons. It's yada, yada, right? Like, it's always, it's always a way to deal with the already existing hand traps, but we're not getting, like new like good ones generically good and balanced ones especially like i i don't think it'd be i don't think it'd be too hard to design something that feels like how effect veiler felt in 2011 or how ash felt in 2017 just make a new version of of maxi and and we're good just get rid of that thing i think it's uh kind of goes into like the second last section here of talking about like the concept of our hand traps fun or you know just do we like them in, as a general concept um, and it's the idea that because, as you've mentioned, they had, they just haven't really made any um, recently, yeah. as least as generic as something like Asher Valor. Um, and I'm wondering if, like, maybe they're recognizing there is a critical mass at this point, right? Like, um, we've seen so many different, like, uh, meme screenshots of people's deck lists where it's, like, three Fenrir and literally just, <laughs> yeah. like, 37 non-engine cards, right? Like, yes. th yeah. I those mean, are deck yeah, lists. And that is another issue that is another thing that i that is one thing in general i dislike whenever hand traps are super popular i don't like when the gameplay is i'm chucking two to three hand traps on my opponent and then they have to pass without even doing anything right because essentially at that point 
there's no real difference between my opponent normal summoning a monster and then I max E them and then they pass, or my opponent normal summons and I imperm them and Valor them after and Ash them too, and then they pass, right? There's no real difference in gameplay. Like it's it's the same, it's the same gameplay. So I I would advocate for like genuinely my favorite solution would be to have more cards like Phantasme, like maybe even that the one thing that came to mind right now was the impulse and fire attacker package, which was a arc it was meant to be archetype specific, right? But it also lets you draw two, discard one on your opponent's turn, and you get a body out of it, right? Um basically may, may more ways modern maxis right like phantasme is quote unquote like a modern 2019 version of maxi because your opponent's first turn play into it you get more cards you get to filter your hand you get to upgrade your hand quality and all that you have a better chance going second i want more cards like that not designed to stop your opponent but gain something for yourself out of your opponent doing something on the first turn right and then you have a more interactive game going second because you have more tools to your disposal rather than just limiting what your opponent can do. I think that's a very good suggestion. Um, I've never really thought of that before. Um, but I will tell you that uh, when we are, you know, now that we're discussing like the concept and just sort of the, uh, this, this sort of like overarching like design of hand traps, I personally, I don't like modern hand traps anymore. I'm not, I don't like that so much of the game can be decide is decided by the amount of disruption you're throwing at your opponent or countering turn one. Um, mm -hmm. Like I really sort of I don't I don't like I understand obviously it's a huge massive um, uh, preventative method to stop wild combo decks from getting out of hand and so you need hand traps. But I think yeah. because of the fact there's just so many now, um, I find it very frustrating because it's like okay well. Um, if I do my current line here, it plays around this, but it loses to this hand trap. And then if I yeah. go for that line, it loses to that. Um, yeah. Just because there's so many, I feel like it's kind of added a layer of complexity to the point where I feel like it's too complex. But I yeah. don't know if I'm really like explaining it well, but it just, it, 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 I feel no, like it's I, very I get, frustrating. I do get what you mean, uh, especially because it's not even just complexity, it's also just gambling, right? Because if you decide to play around Nibiru, but that line plays you into a different hand trap, it's not like you're you have anything to go off of other than like oh i think that card is slightly more popular than that card so i'm going to go for that line but then it's legit just you're just you're just playing the numbers on does my opponent have that hand trap to punish that action um yeah and th this is something that would be eliminated if hand traps were less focused on stopping everything that you do and instead just give you a better chance going second cuz that's what it's all about right we're just trying to solve the problem of going second needs to be more feasible in modern Yu-Gi-Oh, right? Going first, too much is happening, too much winning is happening on the first turn, right? And we need certain cards to to mitigate that, right? Whether that is by stopping the opponent or giving the second uh, player more tools is up in the air. Like, you don't necessarily have to stop your opponent from playing, right? Like, we've seen a bunch of, like, approaches with, like, board breaker store style of things and, like, other, other cards. And I think if we just hit, um, if we just make another good cards that are good going second, um by benefiting off of what your opponent does on the first turn, then uh, we can go like more interactive. And I'm talking like interactive cards for going second. I'm not talking like I want more cards like Dark Ruler. Like I'm talking like the Phantasmes of this world, the like the Magnemutes, the uh, those sort of things, right? And and I, I I if we had more of those and actually well designed ones, I I think that'd be very good for the overall health of the game. The only thing that they would have to do is, or like the one thing I want to emphasize on is I think the cards would need to be usable at least when you go first. You know, they can't be completely dead. Like I think cards like Evenly or Dark Ruler kind of miss the mark in that sense that um, they they rarely find their ways into main deck play, which makes them significantly less relevant simply because if you're going first, those cards don't do anything by design, right? So I would I would want the cards to be more like, you know, once again, I'm, I'm, saying, I'm saying it a lot, but I would want them to be more like Phantasme. Yeah, um, promotion of interactivity is really the most important fundamental thing that they can do in any sort of design space, whether they're making like a new style of hand trap, a new archetype or anything. I think it's always like, can we uh, make players actually like use cards against each other constantly? Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's like the most important thing that they can take away from this. Uh, it just feels like, I don't think it's an, like an exception anymore. I think it is kind of fairly common. 
um, where every other format is extremely hand trap dominated. Uh, mm -hmm. And I, I, I'd say we're probably in one just now where there's just like, yeah. you are playing like upwards of like 15 plus hand traps or something in some decks, yes. right? And it was the immediate, my first impression of that was that that is my problem with the firm, the format, right? It, mm -hmm. That is my issue is with how many times uh, it feels like I'm being forced to pass without doing anything, right? Even though the interaction that would happen if I did something would actually be pretty fun, but it's um, it's hindered by the you know people playing 15, and then we're just playing this kind of gamba game where we're we're just re we're replicating the the master duel mini game with Maxi essentially, but in the TCG way, right? Where we're just throwing hand traps at each other until one breaks through and wins the game, right? And that is not an interaction or that i think is desirable and i don't think that would be the goal with um or should be the goal with hand traps i think it's a, a very frustrating experience to just be hit with like two or three hand traps every single turn and then gamble on which one you're playing around and not playing around and yeah. you know the most egregious example i think is um we've i mean there's probably quite a few where you you can literally just play like 20 hand traps plus like uh your engine pieces right like i think like uh, math mech is like a specifically like very um oh, no. uh bad example of that like in Macedo, for example <laughs> right like it's just this like cybers pile with like literally just 20 hand traps right super heavy samurai yeah. i think might have been pr probably the worst one because that deck is further exacerbated by the fact that it can't play spells and traps so you like people yeah. in tcg i think for the short lived time it was around thank god um it was like people were playing like you know the fifth six best hand traps like people the, the, their maining crow their maining uh mourner yeah. right like yeah. that's how far they're going uh just to um stop their opponent playing because they just have that free space in their deck building and yeah. you know when you're building a deck and you have so many free spots in your deck because your engine is relatively small what cards are you going to put in your deck right it really is just down to defensive cards um and hand traps generally are the better ones right i think the a healthy pick. spot for hand traps to be in that would be desirable or that should be the goal for them in designing them uh going forward that the sweet spot would be they stop the worst out of the worst, like from combo decks. Um, and in sort of like the, the general uh, situation, they stop your opponent from going super crazy, but they, they would still be able to do something, right? They, you don't stop. The, the goal should not be to stop them completely, but rather have them like, if you have one or two hand traps, they can still make like a half board that is weaker than what they would have made if you didn't hand trap them. So it is easier to deal with, but it's not just nothing straight up, right? Some of the worst, like, non-games I've had has just been, like, being hit by, like, Ash Valor Imperm, and then your opponent activates, you know, Circular or Summon Loki exactly. or something that like is, that. That is exactly the gameplay loop that should not be happening. Yeah. Um, but that's the thing, right? Like, we've seen so many decks like this, I feel like, over the last couple of years, right? Like, wasn't, like, Live Twin one of those decks, right? It was, like, a literal 20 hand trap deck. Yeah, I guess. I mean, that that is, I think that, I think that is a particular common thing that happens when one card combos are a thing, which is a whole nother topic, right? That is something, because that sort of strategy is enabled by one card combos, right? Because mm -hmm. if you're not, if your deck is, if your deck only needs one card, like, literal one card to play, then yeah, you can afford to play 20 hand traps. If your deck doesn't work like that, like in most normal Yu-Gi-Oh decks, I mean, like a lot of decks don't work like that, then um, yeah, you can play 18 hand traps, but you're just going to break on them because like you need more than one engine card, right? Um, Four hand traps. Which, but that's that. also one of the, one of, that's what, that's the reason why the Snake Eye deck is also like that, right? That's my one uh, problem I have with the Snake Eye deck is I actually don't mind its, its gameplay loop. It's back and forth kind of, style and stuff like that it's interactions the one thing i don't like about it is that it plays off of one card which allows for you know playing 18 hand traps which creates an development that i don't, uh, an environment that i don't like question is like maybe it's not a case of um having hand traps uh be honed down or like redesigned into like sort of draw style hand traps or more interactive uh in their gameplay perhaps like maybe archetypes just straight up need to just they need to remove one card combos potentially uh, I think, yeah, that, that'd be one way. Like, if they removed one-card combos from archetypes, it's just a couple design principles. If they follow those, then they should be fine, right? Uh, like, just make, make less of a focus on one-card combos, or if one-card combos exist, right? Like, for example, one one-card combo that was fine was how people use Tour Guide in Unchained, for example. Like, if you have a one-card combo in your game, 
then make sure it's it's not completely over the top, right? It doesn't do something completely crazy. Like for example, Life Twin you mentioned. Um, yes, it had a one card combo, but the Life Twin one card combo was significantly different from the Math Mech one card combo, right? There or, or the or the Super Heavy Samurai one card combo, and that that was the one reason why like Life Twin never took over the meta because simply like yeah, it was a one card combo that could play a lot of hand traps, but like the one card combo wasn't that great, so. You know, like it, it wasn't that good of a deck because you would stop your opponent for one turn, pull off your one card combo, it doesn't win you the game, so your opponent plays next turn and like you can't keep up. So the problem is really just if a, if one card combos and does way too much, then it really becomes an issue. Yeah, for sure. And I think that you know, not to say like I'm complaining about Live Twin, but just as an example, um, it, it yeah. I just find it to be frustrating gameplay, whether or not like the end board mm -hmm. is fair or or too powerful. Yeah. You know, it's like being hit by three, sometimes even four hand traps to then just go normal summon a live twin, loci, circular, whatever it is, right? Um, yeah. That's like, I think can be uh, can be quite a, a very annoying thing, right? Yeah, yeah um, it can be, for sure. So, yeah, uh, I think uh, we've gotten through most of the topics that we set out to talk about today. Um, I'm not sure if we've missed anything else in terms of uh, counters and stuff like that. I guess like maybe crossout is worth a, a discussion. I mean, crossout is the same thing as as called by. I think the exact same arguments you would just repeat for for called by. I think one argument that makes crossout in some ways even worse and in some ways better is the fact that it's a less powerful generic card than called by. Like one of the most broken things about called by the grave is even if your opponent doesn't have a hand trap, it still is an incredible defensive card, right? Like your opponent just plays a, a graveyard style deck and that thing is just like in, like an insane form of disruption, honestly. Like you discard a Lubellion and it gets called by it or like whatever, whatever you do. Like there's so many things you can imagine where called by just not even, not only stops hand traps, but also just completely solos as a disruption. Um, Crossout doesn't always do that, uh, which makes it like more situational, but it also just makes it this... This card is clearly just designed to beat hand traps, which is very annoying. I, it's it's very annoying uh, to me, like the, that they made a card that's just the has one that... written I I enable your combo going first type of thing on it. Like I'm I'm not a fan of it. The one sort of uh, quote unquote drawback of Crossout is that you actually have to play the card in order to negate it, True. Um, which yeah. is why I think it further exacerbates these hand trap pile decks that I kind of find really annoying because mm -hmm. you play like something like Exo Sister or whatever with like your 20 hand traps and your Crossout yeah. and your one card combo. And it's like, man, those duels are such non games. Like it's like, yeah. here's, it's a linear combo and you're both just flipping coins to see who drew the, the out to the hand trap out. And I don't even think like that there's that much. I think those matchups have way less skill expression than any other games in Yu-Gi-Oh. Yeah. yeah. I, I think the TLDR is hand traps in the core idea are are good for the game. Interaction on I mean interaction is good. Um the thing is whenever whenever it goes like whenever it just takes too much of people's deck to dedicate it to hand traps, there's a problem, right? And they need to fix that in balancing, right? Like uh, either create more balanced hand traps or create archetypes that are not all in combo decks, but also are decent against hand traps, which then in return would make people play less hand traps, right? But still play decks with healthy interaction, right? And in the specific case of Maxi, I would say just, just design a better version of it that's more suitable for modern Yu-Gi-Oh! if you want something like that in the game. Fix the game, make it better. <laughs> exactly. Literally. Um, I wonder if it's worth like bringing up just as a kind of... Perhaps like in the context of uh, hand traps, because they're very different cards in their application. But I think thrust and talents are definitely worth discussing, uh, discussing mm -hmm. because um, they're yeah. very relevant. Um, especially this format, I think. Like personally, I I think talents is a staple right now. I think it's really good right now. Um, really and one of the uh, you know added benefits of talents is obviously like you know stealing your opponent's baron. Like playing into a board is like really huge. But we've seen yeah. people play it just going first, right? Like you just play that in your main deck, and your opponent yeah. activates a hand trap. Um, you're looping like it, it's especially worse if your opponent uses a low impact hand trap, right? Like they go like ash on something. You oh can yeah, still play, no, you absolutely. Extenders. Yeah, yeah. You loop their hand. Uh, you remove, and so now you have perfect knowledge, which you know a thing or two about that. And you get rid of like an important like starter piece or the second hand trap, so that you can extend. Um, a little bit kind of toxic in that regard, but I suppose like in the context of hand traps. I just feel like we're again. It's this critical mass. There's so much pivotal gameplay revolving yeah. around turn zero, and 
I don't know like what the solution is to that in the grand scheme of things, uh, or if there even should be a solution, or how people feel about the fact that you just have so much going on turn one in terms of your opponent hand traps you, you counter that hand trap, you talents their thing away. Like, I yeah. find it to be, I, f I find that it's just too much, in my opinion, yeah. for turn one. Um, I, I definitely see where you're coming from. In general, I'm split on talents because some of the design principles that I really like are on talents. Like, for example, it's one of those non-engine cards that I view as um, it's good going first and second, which I'm always a fan of when a card isn't dead, either when I'm going first or second. And it also, uh, it doesn't actually stop the hand traps, which I think is the one like kind of positive thing about it, as opposed to some like called by the grave, right? It doesn't actually, like if your opponent's use a, using a hand trap, like on a really pivotal choke point, then even looking at their hand after is like not as, um, not as impactful, right? In a way. Um, at the same time, you can't deny how incredibly powerful talents is and how incredibly good it can be, especially if you're required in a format to draw like multiple hand traps and then use the first one, lose the second one kind of situation is incredibly frustrating. Um, so I think overall, uh, like talents, I'm a fan of talents unless it's in super hand trap heavy formats. Then I, I definitely dislike the card a lot, the, the, the dynamics it creates. Um, yeah, it's kind of like that thing. If the format is in a healthy spot, then Talons is also in a healthy spot. If the format is in an unhealthy spot, then Talons makes it even more unhealthy. I think it was Jesse who once said that, um, like, generally, the more hand traps that people are playing, the worse the format is in general. I, I, I think, I, th I mean, yeah, that's absolutely true. No, because, like, in a world where you can legitimately enter a tournament with zero hand traps most of the time the format's been a banger like it's it's usually like that because that just means you can afford to go second and break boards with actual gameplay um so that i would definitely agree on like the 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 more hand traps people are playing the worse the format is but i i would also argue that that's not necessarily because of the hand traps it's usually because of what the hand traps are trying to prevent if that makes sense right the uh, Q&A part, I suppose, if we want to take a look at questions from chat, which I've got, a, I think, mm -hmm. one or two lined up here. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if it's worth a special shout out to Havnus, one of the uh, in-archetype hand traps. Um, yeah. but, but I think that's like an interesting card, isn't it? Like they made a they made essentially a hand trap that mills and then I, that triggers yeah, your engine. I, I love that design. Uh, and I've, I've said that in the past. I love when they give archetypes or cards in general, but usually it's archetypal specific ones, multi-purpose that makes them better going second. Um, like, Havnus was a card that even if it didn't have that hand trap effect, you would still be playing it in T-Elements, obviously, because of the, the number of names, right? Um, but the fact that it just makes your deck better going second without, ha without having to put dedicated hand traps into your deck uh, is good. Like, that is basically a T-Elements version of Phantasmi, right? You're not stopping your opponent from doing anything, but you get your engine going on your opponent's turn if they play into it, right? And that is what do you mean play into it, activate a monster effect. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, no, but that's not something that you that they do on your first turn, right? It's not yeah, an yeah. advantage that you get when you start the game. It's only an advantage that you get when they start the game. Uh, yeah. And that sort of design, like, is 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 good in my opinion. That's a good design. Of course, the other thing is like, okay, milling is incredibly gamba, but like the idea, you get the idea, right? Like you. Like, for example, rescue is impulse, right? Get your engine going while your opponent is going first. You're not actually stopping your opponent from doing anything. But hey, I get to start the game off with, with extra cards and a body on the board. Um, and that, that's good, right? I think that uh, we were all way too terrified of Havnus, Mila, Mila, Merle, and the Shadal, and then make a win. That's because that of the you. uncertainty with it. Like that's where that's where the design kind of has its flaws. I mean, the entirety of Telemans has flaws in that sense, right? Because uh, a card like Havnus is like, uh, you know, how, sometimes it does nothing, sometimes it does everything. It feels very gambly. Yeah. Um, which, but that's a different problem, right? The problem was not that you could use it as a hand trap. The problem was exactly what it did. The uh, archetype hand trap discussion is uh, pretty interesting because I think that yeah. I think for the most part, like archetypal hand traps have mostly been pretty healthy. Um, mm -hmm. Being able to like bonus search like Mercurier is like kind of fine right i don't think there's any like problems with that b troopers getting um scale bomber i think or something like that um 
that's not really a hand trap to be fair uh but yeah but there's like a, a lot of archetypes that can essentially like um search their in engine ones and you know you mentioned the rescue ace one a couple times which is really cool um searchable and... ones i'm not as big of a fan of because those are by default only good going first specifically mercurier i don't like the design on because it's like yeah okay if i'm going first and i'm resolving my full combo i get to search and negate on top of that wonderful Right, that's mm. not something I really I, that design I can't really get behind because the thing is by default dead going second because it requires a fusion on the field, so not a big fan of the Mercurier design if I'm honest. I don't know. Um, I think that um, I think it's it's definitely uh, what I th what I find is like it's less frustrating if you know it's there. I think sometimes right, and I think I'm not, I'm not saying Mercurier is too powerful. I'm just saying the design is not the same as like a Havness where. I'm always a fan if they design cards. It doesn't even have to necessarily be hand traps that are good, that I have like a solid effect going first, but get even better when you go second. Uh, I believe I even said this last podcast, literally, like, but uh, some like Ecclesia, um, like the way where it's a functional card in my deck if I go first, but it gets even better going second. That is one way you can tackle the second, going second problem, quote unquote, is just make archetypes that have that function going first, right? That want to go first, but then individual cards make it easier to go second without being dedicated side deck cards for going second. What do we think about the uh, rule change that was sort of uh, running around for a while with Master Rule? Um, yeah. Was it every two years we sometimes get a Master Rule that was like suggestions of rule changes? Draw your sixth card going second. Yeah, so uh, for context, uh, there was a suggestion by Paolo uh, a year ago or something talking about how... I, if... Of course Paolo would suggest that. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, uh... no, I, I, yeah, that's that's a very Paolo suggestion. One of the hand trap enjoyers we've got uh, for context. <laughs> um, so the rule would be the player who loses the dice roll gets to start their turn with six cards instead of five, but you don't draw for turn. Mm -hmm. Um the idea behind that is obviously one of the most frustrating frustrating experiences is like drawing a hand trap yeah. for turn. Um, yeah. Drawing into a hand trap like something like Nibiru especially is like almost always going to be dead unless your opponent's doing something really crazy on your turn. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's like it's a, after they full combo, you draw Ash Blossom, you just sit there and you're like really upset. Uh, the one only the, the only negative drawback I saw to this would be like hand loops would be really more powerful. But then like. I, I mean, the, the does it matter loops. if you're looping five or six? Yeah, like the, at at that point, like the the problem is like hand loops are the are the toxic yeah, part I, of the I, game. I right? can't even think of one that's like uh, that 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 would be able to loop. I mean, I, if that existed right now and it was viable, then that'd be a whole different story. But so my one um, fear I, is, uh, you know, I think that it would be. Um, it would just add even more kind of like variance to the hand trap mini game, right? Because now you have that six card, so now you're like, you know, drawing, uh, dropping like, you know, three, four hand traps depending on your deck at your opponent, right? And you just have more chances mm -hmm. of seeing more of those hand traps, and then just more hand traps are being flooded onto you turn one, you know? Yeah. And um, yeah, getting hit by like the third, fourth best hand trap in the game is like usually fine for a meta deck to play through, but you know, you yeah. put two or three of those together, and it's like, well, I guess I'm not playing the game today, so. Um, I think something like that might exacerbate yeah. the situation. I I agree in some ways. I still think that... I, I, I think it would be a solid change. I don't think it'd be the best thing they could do. Because I think at that point, it would just be leaning more into the problem. It would kind of be like, yeah, they're, they're admitting going second is, is too weak and going first is too powerful. But they're not really doing anything about it. They're kind of like saying, yeah, we're not going to change the way we approach card design or whatever right because that would be the way they would really fix it like if you want to do something about going second helping going second and putting a little bit less weight on the first turn of the game you would have to make that by like that that ha that's something that has to happen in card design because the th the sixth card being in your hand already is only going to change the dynamic ever so often like a lot of the times it won't do anything and I don't think it would change enough about the game to actually change the core dynamics. Like, it would just remove a little bit of that element of frustration of drawing a sixth hand trap. And maybe it would, it because you have a better chance of seeing your hand traps, you have a slightly better chance going second. But the core gameplay of I'm trying to stop my opponent completely with hand traps will be the same, right? And so um, I think while it would be, a fix, it would feel very much like another Band-Aid fix to a problem that you can solve in other ways. 
All right. Um, that, uh, I think, probably wraps us up here, unless we have any last-minute um, urgent questions from the chat here. Remember, uh, if you're listening on Spotify or YouTube in hindsight, do check us out on the social medias because you can watch these live. Typically film on, like, I think Wednesday or Thursday has been a fairly common day for it's us. the most common film. ones, yeah. So, uh, yeah, make sure you follow us on the various forms of the social media. I think this has been a pretty good uh, discussion and roundup of hand traps in the game. And um, I think that... Uh, Overall, TLDR, to take away anything from this, what to do about hand traps going in the future? Uh, it's a pretty open-ended question. There's a lot of uh, a lot of design space and there's a lot of ways to uh, address this. And, well, I'm apprehensive to see what direction they take because if one of the last best hand traps made is something like Shifter, um, I, can, uh, I'm, I might be a little bit worried to see where they take this. Because again, like you said, yeah. there's so much room for creativity in this regard they could this is a this is something that's very easy to mess up yeah uh, no but also it's, something... it's um yeah and i think that's the reason why they've been very careful recently and made a lot of underwhelming designs if anything like i don't know sneaky c or whatever they were called yeah all the attempts at making a hand trap uh, in the last couple of years that have all kind of flopped right Mm -hmm. uh like genuinely the only like solid hand traps that came out were like bestials and now like they tried with vados but that's another like tcg only attempt and it's, i'm not even sure if it's gonna work out so yeah uh one final question here that i've uh picked up uh shout outs to me um i did do a whole uh video on this but um an errata for maxi well ideally if we, we that's a card that you just ban or start fresh on but <laughs> Um, my suggestion was, uh, I think the best way, if you were to errata maxi, it would probably be, uh, it only draws for extra deck special summons and you cannot activate any other card, uh, cards the turn you use it. Those, okay. one of those or those together, I think would probably work and make it fair. Uh, not broken, but I, I think it would be quite balanced. kind of like, especially the one you can't activate anything anymore because that means you can still get like OTK'd when you go first and you even disable, like you can't just like set up a bunch of negates and then maxi on top of that because then you would disable your own board. That's when it's um, more frustrating is when you get, when you have that card dropped on you going second. Exactly, like that's the even bigger deal with lingering cards like Droll and Maxi is like they might sometimes be justified going second, but then you make a board going first and have those on top and suddenly the game is like, you're not even playing it. So yeah, no, that that's an interesting suggestion. Um, yeah, yeah. Should they print new versions of Gore's Fader Tragodia like we mentioned a bit earlier? Those cards need, like... If they were to make a battle phase hand trap again and it would be meta-relevant, it would have to be, like, ridiculously strong. Like, the... unnegatable, goddess yeah. of sweet revenge level of powerful without, like, an absurd activation requirement. Like, it would have to be, yeah. like, I don't know, like a, like a Kurikara quick effect for every monster that attacked or... Something it like would that. Definitely or... have to, yeah, it would definitely have to do more than just surviving because most of the time, obviously, like decks, like if they clear your entire board and set up their own board, the question is not just am I surviving the turn, but also have do I even have a chance to come back from the, from that, right? Because yeah, I'm getting another turn, I'm getting a homie draw, but like <laughs> I'm probably not going to be able to come back from the full board, like if they've been able to play through. So like the cards would need to be unable to be negated. They would make sure you. They would need to make sure you survive, and they would need to be. A, they would have to give you some sort of follow up chance as well. So they would. They would have to do a lot. But in in a world where they print the card like that, you know, can't be negated. You know, you summon from hand when your opponent attacks directly, uh, end the battle phase, and I don't know, uh, destroy a card, draw a card. I don't know, like all those kind of things together, right? Then there's a world where people would try experiment with that. What do you think about an unnegatable uh, Mirror Force hand trap? So you can play around it if you put things in defense, but it's an unnegatable Mirror Force hand trap. Um, I think that'd be interesting. Because hmm. it would lean into this... You can, you can win games without overcommitting for an OTK a lot of the times, right? It's like you can try to clear the board and set up your own board without immediately going for game. Um, I would even argue that that card would probably not be good enough because of that. <laughs> it's crazy where we are with this game's power like, level, isn't it? Like <laughs> you just like instead of trying to figure out, hey, can I break the board and OTK the opponent? You would try to like figure out, okay, can I clear the board and poke for a little bit of damage without overcommitting into that? Yeah. But it, I, it, right in my head, it would it create it would it would create more interesting dynamics than than negative dynamics. So I'd be down for that.
I think we're going to, I think that as a future addition to the podcast, we're going to make this uh, a, a, an open-ended comment section question, of course, the farm engagement. So if you've been, if you've yep. been listening this far and you've been uh, tuned in until now, leave a comment down below with your suggestion for a, uh, a, a balanced or well-designed custom card hand trap. Uh, I've given you mine, a unnegatable uh, Mirror Force hand trap. Uh, so leave a comment down below what, what you think it would make for a cool, interesting hand trap that ideally isn't, um, you know, uh, busted. And uh, maybe I'll re review some of your comments on my own stream or something. Yep. All right. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, we've got all forms of social media rolling on this. So uh, Spotify, Apple Podcast, and uh, YouTube if you're wanting to check this out here. So, uh, yeah, feel free to... Uh, follow us on all of those different platforms or whichever one is your preferred method of listening to um podcasts and uh yeah we'll see you in the next one uh yep. we don't know when this episode is going to go up because we have a couple of different priorities right now so i think if you're listening to this it'll be after the phantom nightmare 2 episode which uh yeah i mean we did yeah we did two episodes this week to have one in reserve for whenever we might not be able to film one so this one is like kind of evergreen so it's gonna like come out at some point yeah, so we're always going to have different topics rolling in the background. Uh, you might not see these filmed, uh, or you might not get these on your social medias filmed in sequence. Um, so just remember that, I guess. The more generic topics like this one are always probably going to be uh, outside of the norm of um, any sort of updates and interesting things happening in the game. But yeah, thanks for tuning in, as always, everyone, this week. Have a great uh, weekend, and uh, take care. All right, thank you for listening. Bye-bye.